Hello, everyone from around the world. Hope you can hear me. Uh, welcome again to our fifth installment of the uh, London Proteomics to Costume Group webinar series on COVID-19 and the role of proteomics. Today, we are joined by Professor Ray Isles and Dr. Martin Darnens to discuss their work in this area. As always, we'll be using our Slack channel for questions and discussion. So please join us there and uh, ask any questions or share any thoughts or discussion about the work that you're hearing about. And remember that the Slack channel actually allows us to uh, prioritize questions that you want to hear the answers to. And you can do that by clicking on the thumbs up icon for any questions that you would like to hear the answers for. And also Slack has the ability to uh, allow the speakers to uh, answer any follow up questions that they may be after the talks are finished. So stick around for that if, if you're interested. For those that need uh, attendance, uh, certificates for this webinar, uh, the details about that will be um, given after the final talk. So hang around for that. Um, and also we're going to be running a quick survey just to get some feedback on how you're finding the format so far. And thank you to those who um, who uh, gave us the feedback last time. It was very useful. So we'd like to also thank um, the European Proteomics Association, uh, BSPR and WIPIC, and also uh, the London Proteomics Discussion Group Committee for all their help and support in setting up this webinar. We'd also like to thank the uh, London Biological uh, Mass Spectrometry Discussion Group, the London Metabolomics Network, and also the News and Proteomics Research Blog for promoting this event. And, and we're grateful to Imperial College London uh, for providing us with the webinar support. And of course, a huge thank you to our speakers uh, for their time today. We're pleased to also announce uh, that our next webinar in the series will be on Friday, the 12th of June. Uh, 2 p.m. British Standard Time, and it will be featuring uh, Professor Marcus Rolzer discussing his work on clinical classifiers of COVID-19 infection identified by ultra high proteomics. So first up today, uh, we'll be hearing from Professor Ray Isles. Professor Isles is Dean of Abu Dhabi's University College of Health Sciences. Along with this role, he's the Chief Scientific Officer with MAP Sciences a company that develops medical diagnostics and digital diagnostic applications. Where he's developing IP to market biotechnology tech transfer in cancer, hematology and prenatal diagnosis. Professor Isles is also a visiting professor of forensic science at King's College London. And with that, I will pass over to you, Professor Isles. Thanks very much indeed. Um, hopefully I've got control now. Um, just click over. There we go. Um, right, I'm just going to get straight on to um, the subject in hand. Uh, for about six years now, we've been trying to, or in fact, successfully moving uh, the use of Molditoff as a um, diag as a uh, research tool into the clinical arena. Um, and all of you who are familiar with mass spectrometry know that there are a number of challenges or variables that have to be overcome. Those familiar with mass spectrometry and particularly in MULDI-TOF will know that uh, this includes optimization of the matrix formulation, uh, optimization of the MULDI-TOF uh, MS itself. A lot of settings have to be um, altered. And one of the interesting things that we found a lot with moldy tof is that it's much better to take the data off the machine and process on other software to to get the best out of the spectral uh, data so when we came to switch our attention to covid19 and viruses uh, we had all of these five challenges to overcome but what i'm going to talk about is really the first two challenges here which are chemistry based all to do with how to process a sample to, in order to get extremely good spectral data. So I'm going to take you through in sample enrichment and virus envelope disruption, which are the critical steps these anyone can really fix who've got experience in mass spectrometry. Hopefully it's all going over. So I feel like I'm, I'm carrying on from uh, the talk two weeks ago, where that one left off with uh, Professor Zinsley's group. Um, 
so like Professor Zintz and many people around the world, we were looking at acetone precipitation. Um, and we have done this slightly differently. Um, we have We have moved actually the acetone precipitation or optimized it for enrichment of the viral particles uh, and also as a way of getting rid of a lot of small molecules. So we add our acetone uh, at a one to one ratio with our biological sample at four degrees. We then spin it at 16,000 uh, G at four degrees for 30 minutes. And this is achieves an enriched pellet of your viral particles. You will bring down some large proteins uh, and of course albumin, a little smiley chap who's always a pain for us mass spectrometrists. But the most important thing is you're leaving behind a lot of small, in fact you're clearing small to moderate sized proteins from your sample by doing that selective acetone enrichment precipitation. Now there's a bit Another major advantage of using acetone as a precipitant is that it actually deactivates your virus. And uh, there's a lot of published literature that the, the virus is inactivated by acetone precipitation. Um, so in terms of setting up a clinical assay, this is very important because your biological sample will have active virus and you may have to manage that within a category three containment facility. But as soon as you've acetone precipitated it, you've got dead virus. Um, it inactivates probably by deformation of the viral particle and the proteins or fragmentation even where you're breaking it up into smaller micelles. But it is inactivated and you can actually do the work then on the bench. Uh, and if you're particularly you know, if you're worried about it in a class two, but it's much more safer to actually deal with these viruses. Now. The next step that we optimise is extremely important when we're actually developing this assay technique, and this is the extraction and solubilization of our viral envelope proteins from this cholesterol lipid membrane. Uh, we're not interested in the RNA, and I just like to point out to my molecular biology colleagues that you have one RNA molecule, but I could have 1,000, 10,000 spike proteins per virus. So I'm in a little bit of an advantage over you here that I've got a lot more material coming out from that one virus. Now, solubilization of these viral embedded or viral associated proteins is quite important. Some proteins like the nuclear capsid come off very easily. They're easily solubilized, but others such as the S, um, the spike protein stalk or, or S2 fragment um, is embedded within that membrane. And when we've disrupted, we've got a lot of clumps of, of uh, lipid membrane. So we had to optimize with some very unusual uh, material to solubilize it. I'm sorry, I can't tell you all of that information. It is something that we will let people have, but not quite yet. But we, we are very um, good at solubilizing these proteins and releasing them, and they fragment quite nicely so that we get them breaking apart because most of these are held by um, hydrophobic uh, non-covalent associations or dithiothreotol linkages, uh, sorry, uh, disulfide linkages, which you can easily break. So our application really was to develop this um, methodology for looking at the uh, viral proteins in our work with uh, colleagues at Cambridge University at the Laboratory of Zoonotics, so uh, Professor Heaney's group, who were creating pseudoviruses, which are lenty constructs, where they have spliced in the spike protein for SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2. Um, having developed our technology on the, um, on the pseudoviruses, we're able to look in detail at the spike protein. Now, the spike protein has to be proteolytically cleaved, uh, not only in its maturation, you know, just getting rid of the signal peptide, but also at this point here and this point here to become an active, um, functioning, infective, um, uh, um, functioning machinery. So 
we were able to actually look very much at the fragmentation of this spike protein and we were able to look and detect straight away S1. So the S1 protein here, which came up beautifully and the S2. Now, unfortunately, S2 was coming up underneath albumin and when we grew the cells, the pseudoviruses in serum free media, we were able to see the S2. But of course, when we add dithiothreatol, we're able to find these other crucial cleavages which are occurring within the spike protein here, which fragmented into S2A and S2B, and we could actually resolve both of those peptides very nicely. Um, so these were being held by disulfide linkages, so that's how we were able to resolve them after our extraction and inclu including dithiothreatol in our extraction buffer. Now, the important thing about this is not just what information it can give us about the spike protein and uh, its nature in terms of developing antibodies, um, vaccines, but the whole technology suddenly gave an opportunity to look at viruses in biological samples. Uh, this is just some of the key proteins that we could start to look for to identify viruses. And as you can see, all of them have some kind of cleavage in their spike proteins. Um, most of them, I'm going to sort of just indicate, is that they tend to cleave to expose the fusion peptide. Uh, this is a, a coronavirus here where they only identified one um, cleavage site. I suspect that like all the coronavirus, they have to recruit a, an external protease to cleave here to expose the fusion peptide. So there's a lot of cleavage events occurring. All of these are different and all will produce a uh, mass spec protein profile that is different. And that's exactly what we were doing. So this is um, Corona, MERS coronavirus. There's a spike protein, there's the STA fragment. And then we're getting a host of other proteins that are being released from the envelope membrane of these uh, the plasma, mem sorry, the lipid membrane of the envelope of this virus. There's also a lot more small, smaller uh, proteins that are being released as well. But just to give you an example of the difference, this is H1N1 influenza or swine flu. You can see we've lost that um, spike protein. We've lost actually the S2A protein, and we're starting to pick up hemagglutinin and neuroamidase fragment proteins. And again, a lot of information here. Now, as we started to move from pseudovirus onto live virus, we started to get really interested, not just in these larger ones, but also in these low to moderate size uh, proteins that were being released. Now, what's fantastic is that the, the peak intensities are huge uh, and it's become very characteristic, for example, this lane here, if we look at the, not just the spectra, but also the um, pseudo gel um, view of uh, the mass spectra, which gives you lanes, it makes it much easier to see things. But here we can see in the sort of 6,000 to 7,000 7, MZ region, a characteristic pattern that is uh, identifying um, LCMV or Lassa uh, fever virus. Here, these are two H1N, H1N1 influenza or um, viruses that the VEC school had, and we were able to clearly see that they have similarity markers. But as I said, it's very lucky that they actually had two variants. They had um, the 1934 outbreak of influenza A, uh, H1N1 at uh, Puerto Rico, and also the 2009 pandemic variant um, which uh, was uh, 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 this is an English isolate which was um, uh, ravaging the world at the time but what's really interesting is look we can identify that's H1N1 but there are some peptide changes that would inter uh, indicate that there are differences between these two strains so what we can do is distinguished between viral families, genus, species. So here we have again 
the H1N1 pattern. This is uh, the LCMV pattern that we tend to get. These are our SARS pseudoviruses. Uh, we can see there's a difference here between SARS-2 and SARS-1. I don't know what that is at the moment, but uh, there is clear pattern changes. Um, and it gives you the opportunity not only to look for SARS, but you can look for a whole host of different viruses and match and decide what they are. Now, the application of this findings and this technology is beyond just looking at COVID-19. But at COVID-19 pandemic, we, we have to look to see what the use potentially now and in the future. At the moment, we're moving towards a back to work scenario. Um, the governments are all talking about in, uh, track and trace, and you have to screen an awful lot of people to do that effectively. It has taken four months for the UK to achieve sufficient testing systems. There are about a thousand, a day, uh, sorry, a hundred thousand a day. It's actually been quoted that we need to be doing something more near to 28 million samples a day for effective track and trace. Yeah, how are we going to get there? The reliance is on PCR technology. Immunoassay tests are not really available yet and not reliable. Costs are high. And worryingly, we're dependent on nations, other nations for many of the reagents. Now, the plus is that the test is specific for COVID-19 and highly sensitive. But you can't use that same test on a new virus outbreak. And it could give false positives if there's a significant mutation. It's not easily adapted to other clinical needs such as viral load, which you can do uh, using mass spec. It's quite easy to sort of do a quantitative or semi quantitative look at viral loading. Sorry. Now, I don't think anyone, even the UK, the USA, could afford another pandemic within a short life, short time span. Um, the effect this pandemic is going to have on developing nations in terms of their economies is going to be huge and whether they're going to recover or not or how they recover is really going to be down to testing tracing and, and shutting down infection giving that increasing global connectivity i'm afraid we're seeing more and more zoonotic adaptations and the probability of getting a new viral outbreak is getting more and more likely we have seen three coronavirus zoonotic transitions since in the last 17 years and certainly we were warned about the current pandemic back in 2007. The big question is, could any nation not, you know, not thinking about the poor, but the rich countries, could they cope with the virus had the infectivity rate of something like um, COVID-19, but the lethality of Ebola? COVID-19 is only killing 2% of those infected. I'm sorry, that's very flippant. I shouldn't be. That's, that's a huge number of people. SARS-1 kills 10%. Ebola 30%. Now these are figures where you've got a fully functioning coping health service. If you had the infectative infectivity of COVID-19 and these lethalities, we really would be in big trouble. The question is, could our technological approaches that we're currently using cope with such a future eventuality? Immunoassays have fallen at the first hurdle. PCL has risen to the challenge, but what is the financial costs? And could it cope with more virulent, more virulent new virus to achieve that current testing results? And I could list and go through all the kinds of concerns that we have on the reliance of just PCR type testing. Now, what is needed for global biosecurity is that a is a test that can readily identify the emergence of novel viral infections, so not be over specific. We need to be able to produce results within an hour and a test that can be deployed at ports, airports, as well as our hospitals. We need something that can be rapidly applied to mass screening, so that means it cannot be expensive. We have to have uh, technologies that the running costs of which are, 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 are very low if you're going to be screening millions of people. We can't really be dependent on very expensive 
uh, overseas reagents. It's got to be very simple reagents to actually do this. And on top of my wish list, you know, we've got to uh, have non-invasive, minimal invasive sampling of the population. So it's a big ask of um, the diagnostic world to come up with all of this. Sorry. Now, what I've done is given a little bit of comparison of uh, PCR technology, antibody technology with a MOLDI-TOF protein mass spectrometry approach, which could be an LCMS system. But the features are that the PCR is highly sensitive um, detection for virus. Trouble is development is several millions of dollars, takes six to 18 months, maybe quicker. The costs per test per sample could be quite high. And the time, you know, we're still talking about 48 hours on average. I know it's meant to be 24 hours, but my personal experience, it takes 48 hours from sample to result. Antibody tests, well, they're a lot cheaper, they're a lot quicker, um, but it's going to take a long time to get there and there's still a lot of money to actually develop the test. Um, and in clinical utility, it's picking up antibodies rather than the antigen. What I'm saying is that a mass spectrometry approach, development cost could be lower, development times could be very quick, low cost, fast running times, and a host of clinical utility in uh, the use of a mass spec based technology, because you're not just looking at a specific, you might be able to pick up a whole host of viruses that might be arising. So after four weeks, we progress beyond proof of principle to ready for phase one clinical trials. That's how long it's taken us to do this. We have a little bit of a halt while we're waiting, we're waiting for um, live COVID-19 virus and samples to come in, which we now have. So the proposed home sampling would be a gargle, 10 mils of gargle solution. It could be just water, and it is just water, in fact, spit into a tube. 45 minute preparation time where the acetone is added, precipitation, disruption buffer and placed onto your moldy plate. We use the Shimazo 8020 mass spectrometer. And um, this one is a very fast benchtop instrument, takes about three minutes per sample. And the data analysis can be very rapid, set up the program just to look for a particular markers like the uh, S1 and the S2A as a first pass, and then look for the other markers afterwards. So very rapid diagnostics. Um, I'd like to give acknowledgement for people who are working 24 seven for weeks on end to get this up and running. Uh, that's from Minter from my lab, uh, also my eldest son, Jason, and in particular, uh, Professor Jonathan Healy and Dr. George Carnell uh, from Cambridge University uh, Laboratory of Viral Zoonotics. Funders, I'd love to put up that we were supported by government agencies or big, um, big charities, but no, we haven't. This has all been funded internally. Um, so availability of resources from Cambridge, we fitted in and in map sciences, I have to particularly thank um, my business partner, Ziad Makazumi and Tarek Makazumi, who at the beginning of this crisis believed that we could make a difference and put 250,000 pounds available for us to get another mass spec, get the work done. And I'm really grateful for them. Um, also for nice ad for personal support of myself. Um, just to give you a little bit of hint where we are, this is COVID-19 virus, the Wuhan um, isolate that started all this, just 100 microliters of tissue culture media, and it contains fetal calf serum, acetone precipitated, and using our destruction, optimized destruction uh, buffer, and there's the S1 fragment, there's the S2A fragment, a whole host of interesting other large glycoproteins, and then we get a lovely fingerprint down in this region. Um, we're Map Sciences, and you can contact us on info at mapsciences.com, and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Professor Isles. Um, that was a really, really interesting talk and nice to see, you know, that there's some potentially some different options out there to, to PCR in the future for detecting the, this, this virus. 
Um, we've got a few questions on Slack. Uh, in the interest of time, I think I'll just pick uh, one that uh, has been liked a few times, so people want to hear the answer. So Benjamin um, has said, uh, great talk, completely agree uh, that added benefit is the agility of this uh, mass spec assay to deal with viral mutations. That being said, given this uh, top-down method and your TOF data, what degree of mutation can you confidently detect? For example, can you go down to single amino acid changes? Uh, I, yes, depending on the amino acid, because the, the mass spec is that accurate. I'm I, I actually surprised myself when we started to look at the you know, the complete range. We were just looking at large glycoproteins at first. But when we went down to the smaller mass region, you know, from six to 15,000 Daltons, you will pick up a single amino acid change if it has a sufficient mass change. Hmm. Okay, thanks for that. I think um, we've got a few good questions here, but I'm very sorry to those people. We're going to have to um, move on in the interest of time. Um, so next up, we have uh, Dr. Martin Darnett. And uh, as a biologist, Martin started working in mass spec and proteomics in 2005 during his master's in med biotech. Since then, he has worked in the lab uh, for pharmaceutical biotechnology, focusing on uh, proteomics in a plethora of different subjects, including rheumatology, conservation science, forensic proteomics, and paleoproteomics. In 2008, he helped discover a histine, sorry, histone clipping event in leukemia cells. And this uh, event uh, shifted their research almost exclusively to mining the histone code. He helped establish uh, DIA mass spec by developing increasingly advanced peptide centric data mining strategies using predicted libraries and a novel, more compre comprehensive data format, iron networks. When the coronavirus pandemic struck, his team immediately applied their expertise in DIA to developing a diagnostic assay that targets uh, coronavirus peptide biomarkers. And with that, I will pass over to you, Martin. Hi, sorry, Martin, your microphone's still muted. Thank you, Dan, and, and thank you, uh, Ray. I think we have to stick around after the presentation and talk about the acetone thing. Uh, I'll come back to that later. Um, so I'm here going to, to present our work in trying to, to develop a universally adaptable uh, Corona MRM assay, um, uh, which we took on as a community effort. Um, I think Ray also already mentioned that uh, the main the main issue is that uh, all diagnosis currently is being done with uh, RT PCR, wherein they uh, different labs target different genes and uh, they all have their own uh, uh, primers um, and it works. I mean, it's a workhorse. It's doing amazing amazing things. Uh, I think it's easily over a million a day worldwide uh, analyses that are being done. But that also puts a lot of pressure on the um, on the test in terms of reagents, as mentioned before, but also in terms of um, like benchmarking. There, there's it's it's becoming a, a monopoly, and and it's not that clear on on where we stand compared to other molecular techniques. Um, and messenger RNA is not a, a notoriously stable molecule, but I think it's 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 still fine. But there's a lot of things that need to be verified and. Um, it's, it's strange to see that in, in many of these perspective, high impact perspective manuscripts, they keep on uh, describing different ways of looking at the nucleotides or talk about the serological testing, uh, but never about trying to use a mouse spec to detect proteins, while in fact, probably the time might be, might be here. Um, this is an overview of the talk um, and, and basically of what happened in the past uh, two months in our lab. Um, the way we went forward was by first, um, uh, we, we first had a, a developmental or a discovery phase, uh, which is depicted in blue throughout the presentation, when we looked at recombinant proteins and the first patient samples through um, SWOT acquisition on our high res uh, instruments and, uh, and using the predicted library approach uh, just mentioned uh, by Dan. Um, and then 
we kind of had the first MRM essay in hand and realized that it would be a big effort to get this in the clinic um, anytime soon. So we kind of established a consortium um, and, uh, and build a kit to go along with it. And in this consortium, we, we had the opportunity to paralyze the efforts in optimizing sample preparation, uh, data acquisition, data analysis, obviously, and then hopefully to create uh, a clinical essay um, in, uh, well, uh, hopefully short time. Um, so I'll walk you through these different steps. Um, and for us, everything started with um, public data, just to emphasize the importance of sharing your data. Um, we found in two data sets particularly that two proteins were flying pretty well in the mass spec. Um, at least, or is it a stoichiometric thing? Uh, either way, you can see them pretty well. It's spike and NCAP. It's pretty well known by now that for us um, mass spectrometry people, these are very nice targets to have. Um, and what we did is we kind of uh, started from two different uh, angles. The first one was to, uh, to buy these uh, proteins uh, recombinantly and make dilution series out of them. Um, and we spiked them into uh, these nasopharyngeal uh, swaps from healthy people. And, and yes, we are healthy people and they hurt like hell. Um, and then we had uh, 20 patients, uh, patient samples, which we were blind to, but they too were classified based on uh, the golden standard being qPCR. We got this from the University Hospital in Leuven. And with these two uh, sets of um, samples, uh, we went ahead and started from the idea that if we'd ever want to make it into the clinic, we had to have a very simple protocol. And we started off uh, using these UTM swaps, universal uh, transport medium. This is, I think, the most broadly applied one. Um, and we took out uh, 50 microliters of it, just precipitated with acetone, as I mentioned, um, ice cold acetone, and then digested the, the pellet when, with trypsin for just four hours. Um, we put that onto the, uh, the, the 6600 we have in house and, and acquired SWAT and DDA, both actually. But so we're not measuring more than uh, uh, 1500th of the sample. And then we applied this uh, DIA workflow which we recently published in Proteomics. For those of you interested in what that is, this diamond diagram, um, I refer to the paper and uh, to those of you attending ASMS in the upcoming weeks, uh, there's a talk uh, from Bart, the PhD student who did most of the work uh, on June 10th. Um, and it's entitled Removing the Hidden Data Dependency of DA with Predicted Spectral Libraries which uh, we kind of uh, yeah, attained thanks to the Compomics group from uh, Professor Leonard Martins. So that's what we did. Um, and first up, the uh, recombinant proteins in a dilution series. We immediately found um, uh, around 17 uh, responsive peptides. So these were the ones that actually increased signal as we increased the load of the um, of these peptides or these proteins. Again, we're just using the same workflow as I was depicting uh, just before here. So there's no fancy uh, protocol involved. It's just precipitation and, um, and digest with trypsin. For those of you that are uh, very focused right now, you see that one is not responding at all. We just, we had to keep it on board because that's one that's uh, surfaced during DDA analysis of patient samples. Turned out it was either modified or mutated in the recombinant batch, so uh, we couldn't uh, optimize this one specifically. But it's interesting because we do see it quite a bit in patients, so, so we kept it along for the ride. Um, and so this is kind of how the data uh, looked like when we applied uh, these uh, 17 targets. Well, this is still DIA data, right? So this is still SWOT, but we had a Skyline project uh, mimicking what uh, an MRM would look like um, if we were to target these 17 peptides. These are the 20 patients, well, as one patient here depicted. And you can see that we can pick up quite a bit signal. It doesn't look very high taken from here. Uh, for those of you that are familiar to only looking at MRM data, just know that in SWOT we have uh, basically a 10 Dalton Q1 window. Um, and it's uh, uh, we have high resolution uh, Q3 uh, data 
but it's Skyline that is pulling these XICs at 10 ppm. So that's kind of uh, different from a, from a tandem quad instrument. Now you can see the signal and you can also see the importance of focusing on the um, on the on the transitions. The beauty with SWAT is that you can just uh, have all the transitions. They're all there. You don't lose any dwell time. There's nothing lost in taking them along. Uh, and then you can see how we do need quite a bit um, of, of transition information because there is a ton of uh, interference. I've seen interferences. I'm talking seven, eight transitions. Um, no way in the world I can wrap my head around why that is or how that is even possible. Um, uh, we've tried everything with mutations and whatnot. Point being, we really need to be specific here. And I think also very much robust. Uh, so that's why we like to keep, um, to, keep uh, to take as many peptides along for the ride as we can. So, um, well, this, uh, this was then run and we actually classified uh, 18 out of 20 patients correctly. That was the first time we tried. And next up, we we, we crunched that 20 minute gradient on a high res instrument into an eight minute gradient on a tandem quadrupole instrument. So now we're approaching true, uh, true MRM like acquisition. And we were simply blown away by what we saw. Um, I came up with the idea of just summing all the errors under the curve and block transform them. This is an idea that everybody else would have come up with as well. Um, and we just set out that against the CT values that we got from the hospital. And this correlation was just uh, amazing. So yeah, obviously that was more than encouraging. At this point, we were quite sure we would be able to to, to make this assay work. Fun fact, um, our boss got corona around that time. Uh, he had very mild symptoms. That's why it's a fun fact. Um, and we he, he got a pretty good signal in the, in the assay. So we thought we were just uh, seeing very severe, severely diseased people, but our boss was uh, the evidence of the contrary. Or at least if there's a link between viral load and, uh, and symptoms that we don't know for sure. But at least we are looking at 180 samples uh, per instrument a day. In Gend alone, we could find about 20 of these triple quads. So that can raise pretty fast if everybody would engage, which obviously would never happen, but uh, this is a theoretical uh, maximum. Uh, you probably noticed how these three negative samples here, these were negative. I put them there just so that you can see them. Uh, so the intensity is what we measured, but it was not a CT value of 21. It was way higher. It was classified as being negative. So uh, those of you who know these CT values, you probably realize that these are still pretty high viral loads. And indeed, if we kept on measuring more uh, patient samples, we noticed that the curve bends around uh, 20 uh, CT values. Um, so still again, that's pretty diseased. Uh, some labs go down to 40 uh, CT values, so that's still double. Um, and in fact, if you look at it, the CT value is one doubling of the messenger RNA. So if you want to basically increase your sensitivity and still compare to, um, to PCR, what we wanted to do is to straighten the curve. As opposed, as opposed to flatten it. Um, and we wanted to get some more signal and gain CT values. And that's how we came to think about this issue, this problem. If you double messenger RNA, you gain one CT value. If they have uh, patients being called at 30, we too need to be able to reach that. Um, and according to the Pareto principle, we were at this point where 20% of the efforts uh, had yield 80% of the results, which is a fancy looking mess, um, mRNA essay. But uh, we were very, very conscious about the fact that 80% of the effort was still needed to, 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 to have the 20% final results. So that's why we assembled, um, basically assembled the, uh, the consortium. Um, so April 21st, um, uh, we presented the work we had done in the blue phase um, so far to a little over 80 people. Um, the, um, the presentation is still available by now somewhat outdated, but I do mention other stuff than I will be doing today. So um, 
so you can always go and have a look there. Um, and so a lot of people uh, signed in and uh, and uh, agreed to join this um, this effort. Now the way uh, we we saw this uh, work best was uh, we again we're looking for uh, a robust uh, assay. We know how much interferences there there are. We know that everybody has their own platform going. I think one of the most of the biggest bottlenecks uh, to get mouse back into the clinic uh, in the first place. So how can you make this assay platform independent? Um, we came up with the idea of assembling a kit. We had the recombinant proteins in house. We were still healthy volunteers swapping our own noses. Um, so uh, we had the kit uh, and we um, we basically put a, an SOP there as well for people to help them develop the essay, how we would go about this effort and how we did in the first place. And in the end, we also assembled a uh, Teams uh, group um, in the Microsoft Teams app uh, with one channel per vendor so that people could join the vendors that also joined this effort for which we are very grateful. All three vendors, big vendors, larger vendors, I'm sorry, in Belgium at least, um, Thermal Waters and Cyax, they joined this effort and joined the teams and they made their expert available so that people could directly communicate um, to them. Um, what's in the kit? We had the pure recombinant protein, uh, a few hundred injections worth, and we explained in the SOP that 17 MRM runs uh, would be first needed to optimize the cone voltage for each peptide. And then you would start doing some um, clever things uh, from the acquisition point of view to get your uh, collision energies all right. Uh, so this is all stuff we got from our collaborators in the building two floors up that uh, Kathleen from uh, who did the first analysis. So she 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 made this beautiful SOP that people could use. And then we also made a triplicate dilution series uh, in this UTM medium um, so that people could figure out their LODs. Um, and we send out some 15 of those. In the meantime, um, as people started to, to, to see what they could do on their platform, we uh, continued looking at sample preparation. Um, and I think the one thing that was really obvious from the beginning is this UTM swap contains uh, loads of collagen uh, and bovine serum. For those of you who have ever put collagen on their system, they probably didn't do it twice. It's a nightmare. It sticks, um, it pollutes. It's not a fun thing to have. And if you look at the data, you can see how badly interfering uh, it's or, or how badly it's interfering with your signal. So that doesn't help in data analysis. If, we're, uh, if we looked at our own dilution series, we came up with, um, uh, let's say, an LOD of 20 femtomol on column, which, and again, I heard a different number just now from uh, from Ray, but we were assuming that there's about 300 uh, NCAP uh, molecules in a viral particle based on uh, the, the previous SARS, um, and then we would end up about 1.5 million viral particles. Um, but if you look at pure recombinant, you can go down uh, to 500 atomol on column uh, and still see that very uh, okay-ish. Um, and lucky for us, there turns out to be several other swaps, uh, one of which is being used here in, in Belgian clinics as well, which is the e-swap. And that's one that is being uh, done in saline uh, buffer, so no proteins there. And indeed, at least of the example I'm giving here, this peptide, you can see that it, it has a lot higher signal. There's a lot less ion suppression going on. So um, knowing this, we kind of went on and, and put a, um, a, a decision tree like experimental design. Never mind the small um, the small writing here. The important thing is we tried doing digest at 50 degrees, didn't work, adding calcium chloride didn't change much because it's apparently already in the e-swap. Um, but so we compared e-swap and UTM. Uh, in red here, I'm depicting the, the original workflow. Uh, the recombinant proteins were usually acetone precipitated, followed by digest of four hours. Um, but now we also um, uh, tried TCA precipitation and, uh, and looked at what happens if you do only 15 minutes. In the initial design, we already had 
uh, envisioned to do patient samples as well, but uh, it did, everything is going very fast right now and there's not that many patient samples available. So we didn't do that for the moment, for the time being. Um, either way, um, irrespective of what the other uh, variables were, you can see that every step we tried added at least a little to the uh, median intensity. So e-swap gives you a bit more signal, uh, probably because the ion suppression is dropping. Uh, TCA turns out to, to precipitate better in our hands at this point. And um, 15 minutes digest was amazing. Uh, we got this, this tip from Lee from, uh, from Siskapa. He said, no worries, just try it, it'll work, and it does. So we dropped the sample preparation uh, in no time and actually got some additional signal for it. So now the important thing to realize here is that um, everything you do is peptide specific. In this graph, I'm showing you a log fold increase in signal to the right or decrease to the left for any of these uh, protocols here compared to the original one, which was uh, UTM uh, acetone precipitation and four hour digest. You can see overall we're winning quite a bit here. If you think about it, this could be, you could translate these into CT values. So up to two CT values for one peptide at least here. Um, but I think the take home message here is that every peptide is reacting differently to your sample preparation, which to probably uh, MRM people is not so surprising. I'm a discovery person, so I was assuming that that uh, it, it wouldn't be that bad, but it's it's pretty pretty different. Either way, I think overall uh, using e swaps, it's fun to have this additional signal because of the ion suppression that is dropping somewhat. But the most uh, or the most promising uh, thing is that we now could actually load a 50 fold sample, which still is only 250 microliters. So it's it's really feasible also in clinical terms, but that would gain us another five to six CT values, theoretically speaking. Um, we were happy with the TCA, so we switched from acetone to TCA and we could do a digest in 15 minutes, worked like a charm, so no reason not to. In the meantime, uh, others were in the consortium, were comparing uh, different sample vials, which indeed helped uh, to some extent different ways of resuspending, different columns were tested and so on. So every time and again, we just gained a little and a little and a little. Uh, one thing that we um, that has nothing to do with sensitivity, but we think is a very big addition to the essay, is that we teamed up with Polyquant to uh, design an internal standard for this essay. Um, and it would allow us to assess the digest and the sampling efficiency of our assay because they create this Q concats, which are uh, basically artificial proteins that are built from, in our case, 17 uh, peptides from Corona in their own uh, amino acid context so that the triptych specificity is similar. But we also added four histone peptides, uh, histones being our core business, but also because we just um, saw in the 20 patients that I showed you before, that all of them contain at least two out of the four peptides I'm depicting here. Each of one is derived from one other histone. We reason, and we haven't validated this, but we reason that if you want to take a decent swap, you probably want to have some degree of tissue damage to release the intracellular uh, viral particles. And so this is something QPCR is actually missing right now. Most of their false negatives are not so much about the QPCR technique, but more about the bad sampling in the clinic or uh, the rest house or whatever it was taken. So we are we have high hopes of this and, and Polyquant is working on this uh, right now. So then the data, the data acquisition, uh, people were uh, running uh, the, the kits. Uh, we had labs from all vendors, like I mentioned before, and the vendors actively contributing and measuring the samples in their own labs. I have, uh, for obvious reasons, just uh, called them lab one to six. I'm not telling you which instrument is measuring what, but you can tell uh, this is a bubble plot where I try to summarize everything we got from raw data so far. We got more reports, but we wanted to compare these as objectively as we could. The only way we could come up with uh, to do this was to uh, use one software, which is obviously Skyline that allows you to do this. Uh, but these numbers are pretty um, hard to, to compare. So the way uh, I'm showing the data right now is 
for each lab, I'm showing you the uh, area under the curve for this peptide as it was detected compared to the highest area under the curve for that lab. I think by um, so not taking into account these bigger blobs here, which are certainly interferences, the human eye can tell, a software has difficulties. Um, but uh, I think the, the, the most important and most striking thing again is, yes, uh, it's the peptides. It's, 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 it's really, it's, it's, it's laboratory dependent. What peptide is flying best? Um, it's, I mean, it's again, it's, I thought it would be, but it's even worse than, than we anticipated. Um, so just as for the sample preparation, the data acquisition uh, again is peptide specific. Um, um, and so I think most people could reach uh, about 0.1 nanogram on column in a UTM background, at least with one or two peptides. I'm not saying this is clinically applicable, but and like I mentioned before, the pure uh, detection, we are about uh, 0.02 nanograms, but nobody actually found any signal there in UTM. So uh, there was still work to do, and we did this uh, in parallel again. That's why we had the consortium. Uh, on the data analysis um, uh, level. Now, uh, manuscripts on bioarchive have done um, precursor selection uh, based on, on the evolutionary conservation upfront of developing the assay. We were completely aware that some of these peptides could also be present in other organisms or other coronaviridae, but we took them along for the ride anyhow, uh, just to see how well they fly, who can see them, who can't. But we did the analysis, obviously, and here uh, we're depicting um, uh, the, the peptides on their three-dimensional structure. Um, and the, the bluer they are, the more conserved they are uh, within the family. So the less specific they are for diagnostic reasons. So you want to be aiming for uh, the more redly highlighted uh, stretches um, that are here on the structure. This is something to do with specificity, as you understand. In sensitivity, we did something um, special, I would say, thanks uh, to, to Rolf, uh, Rolf Gavriels, who did this basically the last two weeks. Uh, we can kind of started reasoning that trying to straighten the curve is one thing, but uh, in the end, it's going to get murky either way. So the question is, is this log, log um, sum area under the curve, uh, is this the best metric we have? And he basically uh, started playing around with, um, I, I, I think 87 patient samples, but uh, I think it's probably only 70 that uh, reached him. Um, and, and we extracted a, a total of 433 features from Skyline. And he started training uh, machine learning algorithms with this. I'll refer to him for the details. I can answer some questions. I have a notion of what he did, but I won't go too much into detail. The idea is that based on this data, he was trying to classify diseased and healthy, not by a regression, as I'm showing here. He used support vector machine to classify patients, and he was pretty good at it. Um, what actually is the difference with an expert looking at the data is that you no longer try to only look at the amount of signal. There's a lot of other stuff that is inside this data that is not being used as of now. It's at the sample level, at the precursor level, at the transition level. Um, but he managed to classify the patients pretty well. Uh, basically, uh, his model uh, had a, uh, a median uh, RIC of the area under the curve on a rock, not on the mouse pack, it's a different area under the curve, of 0.91. So that started working uh, pretty well. Uh, he had to do very clever nested cross validations and uh, and whatnot because of the of the the, the the small data set we had. But the net result is that he managed one. He managed to classify more patients than we could. We don't know where to put a threshold. Um, but also he can then uh, uh, give back the, the the feature weight, as it is called in computation terms, uh, of each of the transitions we were measuring. Now, uh, that is basically saying the same as how high is the diagnostic value of each of these transitions. And these are plotted here. Again, this is very preliminary data. We need to do this on a thousand patients, but it's already showing very promising that 
uh, well, this one peptide, for example, the GWIF, it dodged everybody's attention until now. So we just took it along for the ride. Nobody was seeing it or just a bit. It was always there, but never interesting. And all of a sudden, this Y7 fragment turns out to be to have the highest diagnostic value. Why? We don't know. It's machine learning, probably because there's no interference there. It's um, typical for something, something. We don't know. It's machine learning again. We know some things, but it's interesting to have this curve and you can actually communicate this back to the people acquiring the data and tell them to focus their dwell time mainly on the upper ones. If there's nothing else to do, they can take the rest along. But so I think there's something in this. Um, and also just in the end, this plot came in uh, around 11 this morning um, when he showed that if you look at a PCA of all these different features, uh, you collapse it into their two dimensions, which we as humans like best, you see that the biggest difference in these 87 patients was what kind of swap you're using. That's just to emphasize the importance of, 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 of trying to tackle this. Preferably never to use UTM again. We don't like it that much, but um, OK, it's just showing you that these things start to surface. And then, I mean, this is the point where we move to the clinic. Um, what we did in order to try and do this is we contacted the, the National Reference Center for Disease in Belgium again <laughs> two days ago. Bart started doing this, uh, trying to look at these samples. Now these samples, what are they? This is uh, viral particles that were grown uh, and heat inactivated. And the idea is that you as a lab would have to dilute the samples and then see how deep you can detect these viral particles. And this would help you then to start, I don't know what chain of events uh, and what, how many people have to have their say on this, but at least it's a starting point and it shows that you're credible if you want to make it to the clinic. Um, so this was kind of, yeah, well, uh, yesterday at three o'clock, we um, kind of got these samples ready and measured. This was in the case of e-swap, like I mentioned before, 250 microliters um, and uh, 50 microliters for UTM. We did a TCA precipitation and digested for 15 minutes. We did the COVMS assay and this is what we saw. Ah, bummer. Uh, 24 hours before this presentation, Turns out everything was empty. Um, yeah, well, that's kind of things you come across, I guess, if you're on this kind of tight time schedule research. Is it lipid bilayers? Is it the RNA interfering? We don't know. What we do know is that we can measure patients and we can use, measure recombinant dilution series pretty well, but we cannot measure these viral particles, at least if we precipitate them with TCA. So first reason why this failed, uh, could be that acetone precipitation was the best one to go with. Thank you, Ray, for again <laughs> emphasizing it probably will be. Uh, maybe we do need four hours of digest if we're looking at viral particles, but actually I'm, I'm, I'm actually hoping for another explanation, and that would be that we were in patients not even measuring viral particle prote uh, proteins, but possibly, I don't know if it's bi biologically true, but I, I can imagine that viruses are actually overproducing their proteins and in a swap we are looking at non-packed proteins in a, in a patient. If that is the case and we figured out a way to lyse the viral particles, we can again gain a lot of sensitivity in patient samples. So instead of a season finale, we end with a cliffhanger. Too bad, sorry guys. Uh, and it's getting even more uh, exciting, well, uh, stressful if you like. If you notice that there is no longer anybody getting Corona in Belgium, this is good news. Don't get me wrong, uh, but for us, it's a, it's a bit of a bummer. We're not sure if we're going to get enough samples, especially for doing training, uh, computational uh, uh, modeling and, and stuff going. So um, what, with that being said, I really hope that if we join forces with the QPCR people, we can actually help and contribute. So far they do a million or even millions a day. We are at zero right now, so we have some catching up to do. I think it's going to have to be a joint effort, um, uh, but we are for one going to share all the data 
and uh, and try to get the manuscript out as fast as we can. Everybody who needs the data just send an email, but it's going to be on Proteum Exchange soon, and hopefully we can all join forces and get this this essay work even better. So ending with the acknowledgements, uh, I think one very specific person to acknowledge is Bart, uh, the PhD student who did a lot of the work here. He's the one who came up with the idea. I just said, you're crazy, we're not going to do it. But then he just said, we're going to do it. It's it's always going like this in the lab, by the way. Uh, and so thanks to him persisting, this is where we are right now. It's very cheesy, I'm very sorry, but I have to, doing science in Corona times is very hard on your family life as well. So for once, I'm thanking my fiance, Joke, uh, as well here for keeping everything running. And this is everybody who joined the, the, the Microsoft Teams, uh, who showed interest in trying to help us. Um, so thank you all uh, for whatever you have done. And, uh, and on this, uh, I would like to conclude and I give the word back to Dan. OK, okay. Thank, thank you very you much, very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Oh. Dan. Um, there's a lot of questions coming in, a lot of interest. Thank, thank you so much to everyone uh, for engaging in the Slack channel. Um, let's have a look. Um, got a question here from Benedetta. Uh, the pr protein you've chosen to quantify for the MRM assay, how specific is it to the novel coronavirus? Is there a possibility it is expressed by other members of this virus species? Uh, yeah, so that's basically what I showed in the computational slide. We did check that and uh, we're pretty confident okay. that the, the ones we're looking at are indeed, um, yes, shown to the left, uh, are indeed uh, uh, specific to the new corona, except for one which is not even depicted here. So um, yeah, we're pretty confident. Okay, thanks. Uh, did you find any correlation between the intensity and number of histone peptides and the severity of the disease? Yeah, I wasn't sure if I wanted there to, to, to be one, uh, but no, <laughs> we plotted it. There's no correlation. Um, uh, again, I'm not sure if, if you want the correlation, yes or no. So I'm not unhappy that there is none. Sure. OK, great. Um, I think what we'll do is um, just move to our final slide and then we will uh, uh, open up um, if, if, um, if, if Ray and Martin can kind of stick around and have a look at the, the Slack channel questions and 